Ladies and gentlemen, uh, up next, we will be getting into configuration, automation, care planning, puppet, and more with John Sellens, uh, Psionics proprietor with Nightingale Informatics. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for John. Oh, good. You, you may not know there's a TV right down there, and I can see exactly what you see. But actually, they're going to put some cartoons on later, so I'll, I'll be good. Um, <laughs> If you wanted to follow along on your own laptops, if you go to that URL, hot off the press slides are there. Or if you need something to put you to sleep later tonight, just remember that right there. So I'm going to talk about configuration this morning. I'm going to introduce a little tool that I put together uh, for at work that seems to work out fairly well for us. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about motherhood and apple pie and why you should do things my way, because my way is correct. So I, a bunch of years ago, I took a little course on, on what it's like to be a technical person, and a technical person, of which many of us are. Uh, if you don't agree with me, you're wrong. Uh, and nobody can do it as well as I can. So uh, if, you're, if that's your mindset, we're going to get along fine. Oh, you, you forgot those who can't teach. Oh, well, those who can't do teach, or that, those who can't. You know, it's early in the morning. I can't. I can only go so far this early in the morning. Oh, I thought for a moment there was a typo there. That'd be terrible. So anyway, we're going to talk about configuration. My uh, belief is that you should be very organized in your configs. And yes, to start with, it's a little bit of an extra pain to do it that way. But I think in the long run, everything is good. One of the things that marks a good system administrator is laziness, of course, right? You want to make things as easy as possible. You don't want to do things more than once. And you want to make it easy for other people to do things and not break things. So if you're organized and, you, uh, and you're deliberate in how you set up your configs and things like that, my assertion is that it will make your life easier and you can make other people do the work without breaking things too badly. Um, I'm not really a GUI kind of guy. So uh, you know, I've been doing Unix-like stuff for a long, long time, and I believe the command line is the way to go. My slides, you may notice, not in PowerPoint. They're done in LaTeX out of text files. I edit them with VI. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to tell you how to go into the XI GUI and do things just right there. Um, so. My background is primarily using Nagios core um, text config files. You can, of course, use this with XI because you can import config files into XI and you can t put things in a directory, add them into XI. So, um, and this works alongside it. In our environment, I work at a company that does um, online medical records, EHR, electronic health records for clinics and stuff like that. And we have a legacy product, primarily Windows. And we have the new improved product, primarily Linux, which is why I'm there. And so we have, um, we have both XI running with uh, GUI entered uh, configs that are hard to, hard to understand, and my perfect configs that are easy to understand. And they kind of work together in various ways. So configuration. I'm going to assert that configuration is not much fun. There's not a lot of people that say, you know, I want to sit down and, and carefully construct a little file today and figure out what thing is where, and, and this is a web server, and, and this has files on it, and, and there's three file systems here, and, and FTP runs over here. Few people want to do that. I like doing it, but few people like doing it. So we want to make it less tedious. If you're constructing things by hand, it can be error prone. You can forget things uh, that you need to monitor, and of course, when something breaks, people say, well, why wasn't that being monitored? And you say, well, it is now, uh, is how the world works. I believe automation is your friend. So if you can make the machines do work for you, that's a good thing. Uh, consistency, uh, consistency is next to godliness. Let's just put it that way. That if you do things the same way every time, you're going to make fewer mistakes, uh, and you can pass off the work to other people. So I'm going to try and convince you that doing it my way is the better way and less unfun. So some words to live by. So this is the motherhood and apple pie section right here. And this is based on years of making bad, bad mistakes and trying to figure out why I'd made those bad, bad mistakes. Unix philosophy. 
and there's a link in the notes to the Wikipedia page, which had some really cool quotes from the, the old guys. But Unix philosophy is basically make tools that do one thing and do it well, and then tie them together. So you don't want to make a big gargantuan thing, like a giant Java thing that compiles into this uh, one gigabyte WAR file. Not that I have any experience with that at work or anything like that. So small tools that do things well. I want one location to look. And my canonical example of this is a lot of times, I mean, we have DNS, right? We have machines, we have IP addresses. We want to make sure that we keep track of what's what. And sometimes people say, well, I've got my DNS, but I also keep track of everything in a spreadsheet. And that's how I keep track of what IP address is used where. And so now you've got the mapping between machine name and IP address in DNS. And you've got a mapping between machine name and IP address in a spreadsheet. And at least one and probably both of those are wrong. So you should have one location where everything comes from. Separate code and configuration. Um, we use Puppet for configuration management of managing our machines and sending config files around. And I always found in Puppet it's easy to intermingle everything. And it takes a certain amount of um, fortitude and determination to keep the code and the configuration separately. Because in Puppet, you can go into your modules and say, well, if it's this machine, then do this special thing. Or you can use Hira, or you can use uh, the, the uh, per node manifests and things like that. Try and keep it separate and keep things distinct. So when you have a shell script or a tool that you've put together, don't put special cases in there saying, well, if I'm in the production data center, then do this thing specially. Try and avoid that if you can. It's OK to build something. Um, there's different cultural differences depending on our backgrounds. I come from old school where we always had the code, and if we needed something, we would build it. Um, and a lot of people take the approach of, if I need something, somebody else will have already built it. It's OK to build something. There was a talk yesterday on building your own plugins, which is a great example of, I just need one little thing extra. Making a plugin is dead simple, and especially wrapping it around something else, that's dead simple as well. So it's OK to build something, and that's what I built. Do not marry a tool. This is not a personal observation on the quality of your relationships or anything like that. My argument here is, um, and I'll mention this more with Puppet a little bit later on, there are certain ways to do things that are specific to particular tools. Puppet has a particular way of, this is how you should do Nagios configs with Puppet. I don't agree with that. I think you should try and figure out what's the best way for your organization, for yourself, to do things right, and then use a tool to make that happen. And later on, if the boss says, you know what, this puppet stuff is terrible, the, all the cool kids are using Chef or Ansible or Salt, then you can just swap it out, and you don't have to change your entire way of doing things. So try not to get stuck in uh, the particular tool that you're using. Now, easier said than done. DNS is all powerful. It is my favorite distributed resilient database. And you know we all know you can put IP addresses and host names in it. You can put text records in it. And the names that you put in it for the, you know, the fully qualified domain names that you can look up in DNS, they don't actually have to map to a device or anything on a network. You could, have, uh, you could put telephone numbers in DNS if you're willing to put up with the, uh, the four octets of an IP address. And you could look up somebody's telephone number by uh, look for john.sellens.telephone.company.com, and, and there's your telephone number right there. Not that many people would do it, uh, but you can do interesting things with DNS. And so using it as your source of truth, maybe that's OK. Declarative beats computed and observed. So when we're talking about configs and trying to find out what's on our network, there's two approaches you can take. I like the approach of, I know what is supposed to be there, and so I know what I have to do and what I have to monitor. I can go out after the fact and say, I know these 10 things are supposed to be there, and I found 11 things. Something's wrong. Um, the alternative to that is to look on your network and try and figure out just what the hell is out there and what those things are, and why is there a web server answering at address 1.2.3.4? when I wasn't expecting anything to be there. So my theory is you should figure out, you should start from where you believe you are and work out from there rather than trying to discover things that happen to be out there. Now, again, easier said than done. Um, sometimes it makes, um, depending on your environment, how um, 
careful everybody else is. People may just create VMs at random and stick them on a network and then two months later you say, why is this VM called temporary here and is it still useful? Try and avoid kind of stuff like that if you can. Allow empty or inactive configs. So in our environment, we have uh, a number of different Nagio servers in different locations. So for example, I said we did uh, electronic health records. We have US and Canada, different um, medical environments and also different regulatory environments and things like that. Um, we have a central set of common Nagios configuration files that declare a bunch of host groups. And we put the same host groups everywhere, even if they don't apply in certain places. So for example, um, I'm gonna make up an example here. There, we do billing differently in Canada, we do billing differently in the US. You might have a host group of a, uh, a, a Blue, Blue Cross billing server or an Ontario government billing server. Maybe you have a host group for that. And you can declare those host groups in both locations, just don't put anything in. My favorite thing, is it my favorite Nagios thing? Well, it made me happy, let me just put it that way. A few years back in version three, I think it was, there was an option added to allow empty host groups. And by default it's off, but really go turn it on if you don't have it on. And then you can just declare host groups anywhere and fill it in. The same, service groups, for example, you can have a service group with nothing in the service group. So it's good to have a host group with nothing in the host group. Uh, and the, the importance of allowing empty or inactive config is so that you can have your same basic config everywhere. And if there's a machine that that applies to in this particular location, then great, life is good. I mentioned earlier, consistency is the way to go. So um, set up an organization for your files, your host names, things like that. Follow that, be consistent, and your life will be easier. Well, you know, for certain tiny bits of your life. Manual changes are bad. I told you automation is the way to go. So you don't wanna go and change something uh, by hand somewhere or do a special, sm special snowflake configuration for one little thing. Um, Use your tools, use Puppet if that's what you're using, or CF Engine or anything else like that. Um, I told you I'm more a Linux guy, Linux Unix guy, rather than a Windows person. So Windows people, sometimes you're stuck doing things click, click, things like that. Try and avoid that if you can. I hear that PowerShell is really, really cool. Um, I, I, I can't understand the idea of an object-oriented pipeline where it's not just text going from one place to another, but I'm old school, so there you go. Try and avoid doing things manually. Um, use, make tools to do things for you. This is my favorite thing in computer science. All problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. Nagios plugins. You've got a plugin that almost does what you want, but not quite, so wrap another thing around it, run that plugin, and then manipulate the answer. Another level of indirection. So build things out of other things. And my example here, I'll talk about how we do templating later on, and this kind of falls into that category. That's my opinion. You can argue that I'm wrong, but as I said before, technical people, right? If you say I'm wrong, well, I'm sorry, you just don't understand. So we'll go along with that. <laughs> but I'm gonna be very carefully hiding at the break so that nobody can actually assert that I'm wrong. So what's in a name? So the tool that I built is based on having consistent names, and we get a lot of mileage out of having a consistent naming standard um, across the board in the new way of doing things, not the legacy way of doing things. That was not my fault. This is my problem. Everything needs a name, an official name in DNS. There are people in my organization that have not come around to the correct way of thinking I say, what machine is that on? And they'll say, oh, it's on 10.5.33.27. And I'll say, no, 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 really, what's the name of the machine? And they'll say something like, oh, it's the Canadian staging environment. I say, no, 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 what is the name of the machine? And eventually they'll say, okay, it's web01.ca.company.com. Thank you. So um, hierarchical names are, are useful. Um, my experience has been that people that come from Windows environments often look at a, a very flat namespace for machine names. So I've got the domain name of you know, company.com, and all my machines are something.company.com. And sometimes the names get very long, and they put things like the operating system and um, you know, where it is in the name and things like that. Use a hierarchical naming scheme. Um, 
So in, our exam in my example, um, we use things like Web01, so it's a web server, it's web server number one, the location, MSP, Minneapolis, St. Paul, right? Actually, it's at the airport, so keep that in mind. And then a domain name. Uh, the name implies the function. So I have to admit, in my own machines, in my house, sometimes the name doesn't make that much sense. It's just a generic name, and then I pile a bunch of functions on it. But in business these days, because we have uh, cloud servers, we have VMs, it's hard to justify creating one machine and piling a million different functions on the machine. So try and keep your one function per machine. The name implies the function. And then you know what that machine is doing, and uh, then you can build your configs that way. It also it makes the rest of your life easier. Dun, dun, dun. And also, function must conform to the name. Don't say, oh, it's a web server, but it's got a little extra capacity, so I'm just going to put this extra thing on this machine. Don't do that. It's bad. Um, there was something else important here I wanted to say. Oh, the domain name. Uh, in the slides here, I use the domain name myco.ca. I'm Canadian, I, but I was originally going to say myco, my company, .com, but I had one slide where it was just a little too long, and it wrapped around the line, so I shortened it by one character, and, and everything went well. We use, here's a trick for you. So I learned this at the previous company I was at, FreshBooks, a lovely place for doing billing. FreshBooks is fabulous people, and the food is good. But um, we needed names to use internally, but sometimes we needed to put SSL certificates on them. So I said, well, let's just make up a domain name, you know, make up our own top-level domain. And then my boss, smart guy, said, but then you can't buy an SSL certificate for it. So even if you're just going to make up an internal domain name, get an official domain and only use it internally. And then if you ever need an SSL certificate, you can go buy one for 10 bucks, and life will be good. And you don't have to make up your own certificate authority and things like that. Now, here's the cool thing that I like. We use the domains from India because it's a .in, and .in kind of sounds like in or internal. So you can go register your own .in name. And they're not, they're not extortionate. They're not like some domains where it's $500 a year. They're just cheap like everything else. So make your own domain names. Uh, buy your own domain names. So how we do configuration. The old way of doing it was we would handcraft the one-off config files. You'd go in and edit things. And in my personal monitoring at home, that's what I still do. It's all custom stuff, and it's been there for like eight years. And it's getting uglier and uglier, and I feel bad about it every day. At work, I try and do things just right. When you're handcrafting them as all one-off things, it's easy to make mistakes, typos. It's easy to put in repetition that you don't really want so that you've got, this is how I check a web server here, and you've also got a copy of it over here. Um, and it's easy to forget things, like which machine really should be there, uh, what should I be monitoring here, so if you copy this file from here, maybe you're going to do something wrong. Uh, if you need to update one thing, I say, uh, I've got a contact that needs to change. Maybe that contact name is in multiple different places. Try and avoid that. So old school configuration where you're just editing stuff. I've been using this software since it was called NetSaint. So I've been doing these bad things for a long time. I've learned my lesson. So try and avoid this if you can. This is the point of this talk, right? There are things over the years that have been created to give you some configuration assistance. The, probably the thing that we're most f familiar with is um, the Nagios XI Core Config Manager, which I think is based on Nagios QL, if I recall correctly. Uh, there's been a number of other things over the years. Um, we've probably, most of us, heard of Webmin. There used to be a Webmin interface for managing uh, Nagios version one configuration files. I kind of hated it, but I had to use it in one place. And there's been various other things over the years trying to give you a, a GUI configuration. One of the things that I find difficult about those is it's hard to, I, I think it takes a certain amount of um, care and intention to avoid making mistakes and duplicating things. Um, as I said, we have Nagios XI running on the legacy systems at work. And I see a lot of duplicated stuff. And OK, this is a web server. And here's the configuration for this web server. Here's another web server. And I've set up the same configuration for this web server. So a certain amount of duplication. Um, so and as I said, I'm not really a GUI fan. If you're careful, so sometimes I call myself Mr. Pedantic Man. That's my superhero skill, Mr. Pedantic Man. Uh, if you're very careful and you organize things properly and make the files 
nice and you make a nice little hierarchy of your config files, you can avoid some of these problems. Um, but it becomes an exercise in trying not to make errors. And as I said earlier, you want to be able to make other people do your bidding. And if it has to be perfect in your one way of doing things, the other people may not agree and they'll do it wrong. So you'll have to go and fix it after the fact. You, you don't want to do that. So try not to, you know, again, I'm trying to argue that you should avoid doing things manually. Simple automation. So everybody believes that Nmap, you can do, if you go out and buy a monitoring tool or you look at the sales stuff for monitoring tools, they all say automatic discovery. We're going to solve all your problems for you. We'll just put it on your network. We'll find everything for you and everything will be good. And I don't really believe that is a reasonable way to do things. I believe most of them just do Nmap scans of your network and then they figure out what ports are open and they say, and Nmap will tell them, oh, this is a Linux box or this is a Windows box. And you can kind of guess what you can probably do. Um, so you can run Nmap. There's a tool called Nmap to Nagios, which in theory takes the XML from Nmap, converts it into Nagios config files, and then you can pick and choose what's important out of there. As I said, this is, I believe you, could be, you should be declarative rather than computed. This is kind of being computed, where you figure out what's out there and you try and make the best of a bad situation. I think this is kind of the way to do it upside down. But if your coworkers are bad, bad people and they just stick stuff on the network, maybe you have to do this. So a few things you can do for some more simple automation. I've written a few plugins that try to be smart. So. Um, We've all had this situation where we've got a machine that's got a bunch of volumes on it. Maybe it's got a, if it's Windows, it's got a C drive and a D drive and an E drive and an F drive and a Q drive just to be, leave a gap in there. And then a Z drive. Um, and every time somebody adds a new volume, you have to go and say, okay, well, I better add a check for that. So I've written plugins that ask a machine, what volumes do you have? And oh, look, I found a new one and I'll just make up a threshold for that. Uh, and I originally wrote that years ago when we had a network appliance file servers, and we created all, many, many volumes all the time. So I ran it against the NetApp, and I would find new things that arrived and start monitoring them without human intervention. So if you have a smarter plugin that tries to figure out what's going on, it can make your life easier. Um, there's, I think it's, there's one plugin, and I don't think it's check MK, but there's some plugin that essentially, you run it on your machine, and it'll tell you everything about everything and then give you one good answer. Machine is good, machine is bad. I'm not sure that, I've always wanted to really do that, but I'm not sure it's the best way to do it. But again, unpredictability if you don't know what you're actually trying to find. So the, the simple automation ways are, I say they're kind of a blunt hammer. You're not gonna be as exact as you wanna be. Um, when you're doing a scan with M Nmap, you hope nothing's broken when you're doing that because then Nmap won't notice that the web server's not running. And so you'll won't, you know, the web server is just rebooting when Nmap said it's port 80 open. So no, it's not open right now. Um, you hope firewalls aren't blocking anything. You hope, you know, your network's not broken. If you're doing scanning to find out what's on your net, how, how often do you, do, the, do you look? Do you look every half hour? Um, that might be a little complicated. And if something disappears off your network, is it broken or did somebody turn it off on purpose? So I'm not sure that these kind of ways of doing things are the best. So now I'm gonna tell you ways that I think are a little bit better to do configurations, and I'm gonna tell you why they're bad and my way is the one true way of doing things. Mr. Pedantic Man, there you go. So in Puppet, there was a talk last year, uh, Mike Meredith from Victor Ops, uh, yeah, right there. I was you mentioned it yesterday, so I said, yes, that's right, and I wrote it down, and in my notes it says Mike Meredith, and it spells your name correctly, I hope, um, because you've got an I and an E, and I wasn't sure exactly where the I is. Um, not backwards, just less common. There, there you go. And, and what the traditional puppet way of doing things, and if you Google puppet Nagios, it says, here's how you do it. Um, and so a little puppet terminology. In puppet, you have um, the, the master server with all the config. You've got a, a puppet agent that runs on each device out there. The agent contacts the puppet server in one way or another, says, what should I do? The, in the puppet configurations, there are things called resources. So if this file must exist, you declare a file resource saying it must exist, must have this ownership. So you, you declare in your puppet configuration how things should be, and it's implemented on the machine over here. You can have what's called exported resources, where 
uh, for a given machine, Web01, when it runs Puppet, Puppet says, oh, you're a web server, you should have Apache running, and you should have this directory there, and you should have this file, the index.html file should be there. But also, export these resources. And what that does is, it doesn't actually do anything on the machine where Puppet is running right now, but it writes down the information in that exported resource, sticks it in a central location, the Puppet DB or some other mechanism, saves that, and then anybody else can come along and grab that information. So the traditional way of doing Nagios configs in Puppet, you have a, a module for setting up a web server, and the web server says port 80 should be running. And so you have your Puppet config, and then it runs on the agent, and then the agent sends information back to Puppet here, and then some other machine, your Nagios server, goes to the Puppet database and grabs some information that this, this machine put there for it, and then it runs those, and then it makes, Puppet conf it makes Nagios configs over here, and then runs them, and everything is good. There are things about Puppet that are not really my favorite thing about Puppet. That's one of the, fav the things that's not really my favorite, the fact that information goes like this, and it seems kind of convoluted to me. I think it's kind of upside down. Works well for many, many people. Works well for Mike, apparently. Hopefully, unless he's changed his mind from last year and he just hasn't told us, but we'll, we'll see what happens. But, so, I, I'm not really crazy about the mechanism, and it's very Puppet specific. Now, when you use configuration management, you're crafting all these config files, and everything you do is specific to that particular tool. So, you know, I'm telling you a lie here, one way or another. So, it's not really my favorite way of doing things. Um, and, but, but it crafts the configs from the point of view of the host, rather than the point of view of, this is what I know. Sort of. But it's not my favorite way of doing it. So, I'm coming back. Now we're coming around to my way of thinking. I think you should generate from expected, not from what you find out there. Say, this is how my world should be. I'm gonna use this to generate my configs, and then I'll know if things are good or bad. Yeah, I've said all that. Uh, the tool I have primarily works as a host-centric viewpoint right now. It can be easily changed to do other things, but right now I'm only using it for hosts. Basically what I do is I say, give me a list of all the hosts that exist, I'll use the names, I'll generate configs based on the names, and life is good. <laughs> so for example, uh, what I mentioned here is that, so right now I'm working from a list of hosts. I could easily have a tool that gives me a list of all the websites that exist in my world and go and check those websites, make sure that they're up and running and returning a page. Or I could have a list of website URL and here's a regular expression that I should find in the top level page and go and check those things and I can generate a config to do that. Um, uh, and the other example is sometimes you have a service that runs on multiple servers, like a load balanced clustered service. So you gotta be able to check the service which is distinct from checking the hosts. So as I mentioned, in our environment we do electronic medical records. We have a bunch of different environments, US, Canada, production, staging, conversion, where we convert people from other systems. We have demo systems for sales, we have sales uh, systems for developers and things like that. We call each of those instances a pod, because we had to make up a name that sounded science fiction-y. We called it a pod. And in a pod, you'll have a web server and a, and a Jetty Java server and a database server and a file server and you know various other things that move stuff around in various ways. But all these pods are very, very similar. So I can use the naming convention to create configs based on whatever, and when I create a new pod, the configuration gets built automatically and everything is good, and I sleep well at night because I turn off my phone. <laughs> so, <there you> go. <laughs> so it's slightly dynamic. It's not a really, um, we're not a, a cloud-based service where we have to respond to demand and you know, oh, we gotta fire up multiple webs, more web servers because it's the busy time of day and then turn them back down. If you're in a very dynamic environment like that, um, this won't work quite as well because this uh, relies on running periodically rather than instantly, uh, but you may be able to take some lessons from that. <laughs> uh, and what we've done, have legacy system, have the new way of doing things. I've been there for a little over a year, and part of the reason I came in was, this is how we're gonna do things. We're gonna do things consistently, like with Puppet and configuration files and proper documentation and things like that. So uh, we try and do a little consistency. Our environments aren't real huge, um, so in some sense this is a little bit of overkill, but we're setting ourselves up just for ease of use over the years. So, we have a naming convention that fits our needs. We have multiple similar environments, pods. Uh, remember I told you about DNS, you should have a subdomain. The, in the subdomain, we have a subdomain for each pod. 
Um, for example, New York um, production, NY1P1, that's a pod. And so we have web01.ny1p1.company.com. We have multiple Nagio servers. We aggregate them with Thruk. Um, and we use Puppet for sending stuff out. Dun, dun, dun. And I mentioned those other two things already. So the naming convention, we have an internal only domain, um, mycompany.in. Because I don't want all the .in names to be taken next time I want one. So yeah. We have a subdomain that don't, denotes the pod. Uh, the host names are named for the type and a two digit number. So here's a hint, never use just a one digit number because there's a pretty good chance eventually you'll have more than nine of them and then nothing will sort properly. So always do at least 01. And if you're bigger, then do 001 to start with if you believe that success is coming your way. The name, so in the tool, the name of the machine, Web01, says you're a web server, you have to have these things. I have a Nagios host group called Web or DB or uh, Mirth for the Mirth servers and things like that. Mirth is this healthcare uh, messaging thing. And, I, and also my puppet configs know, oh, your machine name is Web, I'll apply this puppet configuration against that. Uh, so it, it takes the, the host name apart that way. We have a method to list the hosts. So some people will have a configuration database. You can ask your database, tell me all the machines I have. I have a much more simple-minded way. I'll admit I get my host list from asking Puppet, what machines have checked in recently in the last three days? And the host list is um, generated sort of automatically that way. I have a command called host list. I give it a pattern. So if I say host list NY1P1, it tells me all the machines that are in NY1P1. Now I could do the same thing by querying date, uh, DNS, doing DNS zone transfers and parsing those things out. If I had a configuration database, I could look those up. If I had a spreadsheet, I could slit my wrists and, and you know, deal with that. But you, there's various ways. But you need a way to get a list of all of the machines you care about. <laughs> and again, we're looking for what we expect to have, not what we happen to find right now. Organizing the config file. So I have one directory of Nagios configs. And I have a bunch of subdirectories. I have a common subdirectory, which has all my host group, service group, contact names, um, uh, commands, all those definitions, time periods under there. And then I have a separate directory for each pod, because there are one-off things in the pods sometimes. Um, and I can use my tool to iterate, iterate across those subdirectories. So the same way I use subdomains in DNS, I'm using subdirectories in my file system. <laughs> and in each of those subdirectories, I could have um, special one-off things for, I know that this pod is going to have a higher load average, so I can bump the limits there, things like that. And the puppet configs tell each Nagios server what uh, pods that Nagios server should be monitoring. So it's got a list of subdirectories to work on. So the basic config building idea is we've got a host name prefix that says what the host type is, a host group for each host type, and we define the services based on the host group. So we don't have any services that say, this service applies to this host. We only have services that say, you know, check HTTP on all the machines in this host group. We have a template for each host type, which can um, set contact information or um, various other parameters, um, com custom object definitions, or you know, custom. Custom, oh, I can't remember what the custom thing is. That's my favorite thing, where you can make up a variable in your config, your object definition. You can say load worn but with the underscore thing. I'll remember what it is later. Um, we can have optional fragments. So something special for this particular pod. Um, don't wake me up in the t if something goes wrong in the test pod. Change the, uh, the time periods and things like that. You can have custom for, per host group and host. And then the, the building tool steps through the list of hosts, get, uses the host list command, tell me all the hosts I should care about, steps through each of those in turn, builds a host, um, a host object definition for that host, puts it in a file, and the world is good. And the command called it nagGen for Nagios generator. Pretty clever, huh? So every host type has a template. And here's an example uh, of the templates we're using. I used a naming convention. I put ht underscore the, the host type, uh, HT is just host type, so that it won't conflict with any other host group that somebody might happen to make up. And I put some things in there, and there's custom, uh, custom object variables. Is that right? Yeah. 
with the underscore thing. So those are load limits that I can use in my, my check commands for checking load average. And again, it's register zero, so it's just a template. So I have a, whole, a file of all of these for every type of machine I have. So I have, there's templates for uh, web servers and database servers and, and Jetty Java servers and things like that. And Naggen also automatically includes the template Linux server puppet template. So it's kind of a hack, but you could build it into these templates. I just wanted to avoid a certain amount of repetition. I can have a host type fragment. So in, in my hierarchy of config files in the common directory, common host groups db.frag. If Naggen is going along, finds a database server, it looks and says, oh, there's a fragment here. I'll include that as well. Um, there's a funny thing here, um, the host groups thing in this example. Being able to say host groups plus is a great thing, but in one object definition, you can't do that twice because only the second thing um, takes effect. We'll see how that works a little later. So I do, this is slightly ugly. I can work around it in a particular way, and eventually I will. I can have a host specific fragment. So here, the production database server in New York, I know that it's gonna be extra busy because we've got a lot of business. Everything is great. So I bump up the load average limits, and I know it has a bunch of CPUs, so that I can set those things there. 936, okay, life is good. So I use NegGen, and this is what the host definition becomes in the configuration file. So the first part of it comes from the, um, well, we include the template, the host name, alias, and address. They come from the host list command, which told me about these machines. I shortened, I took off the domain name on host name and alias just for human convenience seeing it in the web interface. We'll just assume that that domain's there. And note that, note that address is the DNS FQDN and not an IP address. That's a religious thing with me. And the host groups plus DB, that came from the fragment right here on this. No, it didn't, came from right here. Oh, no, uh, sorry. It's early in the morning. The host groups plus DB, the naggen command adds every host to the host group that it's named for. So naggen sticks that in. Then there's the two fragments from the common one saying, saying, oh no, really, I want a database server to be in those two host groups, DB and PostgreSQL. And then for this particular host, there's the fragment for that particular host saying, and we're gonna bump up these uh, load worn and load critical things, overriding what's in the standard template. So as we've seen, the fragment is used to override uh, default settings or put particular things for that particular host. Um, and these overrides, because in a Nagios object definition, if you use the same um, variable name mul more times, multiple times, it's only the last one that takes effect. So in this example, see I've got host groups there and host groups there. The second host groups is the one that actually takes effect. It would be nice if, when I said host groups plus, multiple times in an object definition if they all took effect, but that's not how it works. And I can understand that. Um, so overriding things in fragments works better if the previous setting was in a template. Now, what I could do to solve this problem, every time I find a fragment to include, I could create a new template, save what I've got in that template, and then start a new object definition that uses that template. And so that, I, so that I could essentially get additive host groups plus through that mechanism. I haven't been motivated to do that yet. It's been a little, you know, you try and build a simple tool and then it gets more complicated. I'm trying to balance that out. There you go. So, and how this works is Puppet runs naggen cover, a cover, another level of indirection around the naggen command. Puppet on a nagio server runs naggen cover every time Puppet runs. Naggen cover invokes naggen to create the config file. And it looks at what it gets from naggen, compares it to what's already in place. And if they're the same, it says, okay, everything's good. I'm not doing anything. Exits quietly. If they're different, it updates that file. And then Puppet notices that that file has changed and will trigger a nagios reload. So we're not doing a nagios reload every half hour. We're only doing it if something has changed. And so possible enhancements we can do here. Um, I probably want per pod fragments. 
So for example, I mentioned this a moment ago, in the testing environment, maybe I want notification time periods to be, um, to be only during work hours. Or on dev machines, the notification time period is never, because if they break it, then that's their problem. Um, so if we have a per pod fragment, we could easily add that in, in the same mechanism. I probably want to be able to do this to apply to service names. Um, so right now, it's just host-based creating that, but I want to be able to apply it to um, websites. Have a list of URLs that I care about, make sure that they all work, and make sure that they're all giving the same regular expression back. Um, should be easy to do with the same mechanism. Um, maybe some macro substitution, so I can say um, set a puppet variable or set a variable in some configuration file and then substitute it into command names or something like that. But again, as I said, simple is nice. As I was putting the notes together, I was thinking, well, what, what's wrong with this? Because really, when you say this is how you should do it, you should always say, and this is why you should not do it or what the, what the downsides are. There's no way currently to define dependencies. So for example, my database server will not work unless my file server is working. My web server will not work properly unless the Java server is working. There's no current, currently no way to declare those dependencies. Um, I'm not exactly quite sure how to do that on an automated fashion across multiple machines. Um, obviously, there's a way to do it, but I haven't found a nice, easy, peasy way to do it, and I haven't cared that much about it yet, sooner or later. And as I mentioned before, if you're in a very dynamic environment where you're spinning machines up and down, it probably, this mechanism probably doesn't work as well, but hopefully you can take some of the things I've tried to put forth and, uh, and get something out of that. So I think this is a, a reasonable approach. I took a small tool. I used a little bit of indirection of wrapping things around it. Um, it's not puppet specific, so I gave you all that list of motherhood and apple pie opinions at the start. Hopefully, I've conformed to those. And if I did my notes right, I wouldn't have written down something that wasn't going to follow through in the end. So hopefully, I've been consistent with myself. It's comprehensible, so other people can do it. It's fairly automatic, so if a new pod comes up or a new web server gets added, it gets monitored automatically. Uh, it encourages consistency amongst my coworkers, and it fits in alongside the more typical configurations. So we've got specific configurations. I mentioned the legacy stuff is in Nagios XI. This all fits alongside that nicely, and we can migrate from one to another as time goes by, hopefully. So consistency, hopefully I'm consistent. DNS is the one true way. I'm using DNS to do the right thing. Being pedantic is the way the world should be. And simple tools are, are good. Um, glue, you know, in the Unix philosophy, you take different things, make little tools, and glue different things together into a, a, a better whole, hopefully. OK, now, 9.42. If I'll just show you just quickly how, if I remember how to get there. Ah, yes. Um, I wish I still had my best way. I don't like these new user interface things. I want an old TWM X Windows thing that I've been doing for 25 years. Thanks very much. So just very quickly, the uh, commands themselves. So the naggen command, here's the guts of it down at the bottom. It's, um, it takes arguments on the command line, basically, of the different pods or different directories to work on. And it says, invoke the host list command once for each of those. Give it a pattern. So one of those things will be um, NY1P1. So here for find all the hosts from NY1P1 and then make a config section for that and spit it out. And the config section generator is this little, um, this little function here where it takes the host name and figures out the base name for it and echoes out some things. So there's the first part of the config there, adds the host group based on the host name. And then it looks for fragments in particular, you know, it looks for a host group fragment in the common host groups directory and then it looks for a per host frag, and if it finds one, spits it out. So the thing that actually generates it, it's a dead simple little script. Uh, and then the naggen cover thing is again dead simple. Uh, ooh, ooh, uh, I'm gonna go into VI rather than trying to use a scroll bar. Scroll bar's bad. So right here, we run naggen into a temporary file. Notice if it failed. You know, always check your error results, right? We always do that. Then it compares. If the, the destination file, if the real file does not exist, well, we're going to replace it, replace the non-existent file. Otherwise, we compare them. 
Um, decomment, just there's a comment that I put in the file for date when it was generated, so we don't want to keep replacing it just because the date has changed. Um, compare the two files, replace them, and if we decide to replace them, it says, okay, I'm gonna replace this, and puts a comment in the file, puts it in place, and there it is. So very dead simple things, and he says, wrap it up, because it's 9.45, and I'm done. Any questions? Thank you, John. Uh, anyone with any questions, feel free to put your hand up. I'll come personally by. I think we have enough time for a couple here. Oh, no, that's not what I want. There. Um, your um, first slide, just, yeah, that's, I want your URL. There's the URL right there. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Anybody want to tell me I'm really, really wrong? So it's the first session, the morning after the night before. So. <laughs> how do you handle one-off instances? So uh, how do we handle one-off instances? Uh, I told you that we organize the configuration files into subdirectories. So I have a subdirectory called NY1P1. If I have a special machine in NY1P1, I just put a, a normal config file in that directory. So in the Nagios, the Nagios.cfg config file, I use config dir um, options in there, declarations. Never say config file in your Nagios config file. Always say config dir. Just give it a directory, and then you don't have to keep changing it every time you add a file. So I say include anything in this directory. So that directory has .cfg files, which Nagios looks at, and .frag files, which my tool looks at. Uh, when you talked about exporting uh, resources with Puppet is to the Puppet DB, are you using are you using fax for your external resources, or what specifically is that is entered into Puppet so, DB? Okay, so with the Puppet exported resources thing, I don't use that mechanism currently, but I believe the way that it works is um, just in your your Puppet manifests, there's a special syntax. If you say put at at in front of a a file resource declaration, for example. That's, that means don't actually do this, but write down what this means and put it in the Puppet DB. You put at at in front of it, is that correct? I think, I think it's a single at. A, a single at in front of it. So there's a mechanism in Puppet that lets you say that. And you could tie that in with facts if you want, but you don't, doesn't require facts, custom facts. I got time for uh, one more here. So DNS as the source of authority for everything, are you using um, extensive use of text records or what other st kinds of stuff are you putting in there aside from IP information? So uh, the question was DNS, source of authority, um, configuration database or host database. Um, right now we're just using, because we have a naming convention that declares what the thing is, most of our machines are virtual or cloud machines right now, so we don't have to keep track of um, like manufacturer or service records or things like that. So we don't currently do anything with text records that way. Um, but certainly you could. And in the past, long ago, I worked at the University of Waterloo, and one of the things we put text records in for was um, the name of the prof that owns this device. And so you could look up in DNS who to call if this was misbehaving. But yeah, you can use text records that way. Um, I use, um, one of the things that drives me nuts about uh, Active Directory DNS is I believe that you can add a record, but there's no way to put a comment on the record. So if you're using Active Directory for your DNS and you want to have information there, you have to put it in, add a text record, or keep some other mechanism. Uh, we use, internally for this domain, we use bind name D. So we can put comments in our configuration files if we're so inclined, or easily add text files. Uh, and you can, of course, if you have another method, if you had a proper database, you could use that database to generate name deconfig files, zone files, and so you know that they're consistent that way. But yeah, you could use text records we have in the past, but not in the, this particular case. All right, well, thank you very much, John. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, John Sellins. Thank you very much. <laughs>